me on very different topics, which is good. Okay, uh, I hope um, all groups will be. Uh, I mean, we can learn uh, from all the different groups. All right. Um, I hope we can pay attention to the speaker. All right, and have spent time preparing this. Um, so give respect to them. All right. Um, just hear them out, even though. Okay, uh, you might not fully understand the presentation, but uh, at least you just try to understand, you know, what, what is interesting about what they are going to present. Okay, so uh, at the end, I'll give you a QR code uh, to vote for the audience choice. Okay, uh, I'll announce the result uh, later. All right, so after I've consolidated the, uh, the voting. Okay, so let's begin with the Hochisins group. Hello, so very good afternoon to our history friends. So, uh, today, we'll be, so today we'll be presenting on nanoscience and nanomaterials. I'm James, that's Ellen, Roy, and Xiaoyang. So firstly, we'll be doing a short introduction to nano before talking about the chemical synthesis, followed by application. And lastly, we'll just be doing a short um, covering, a short, brief, a short briefing on the future of nano. Okay, so firstly, the introduction. So obviously, when we talk about nanotechnology, the word nano can tell you that nano is really more about the manipulation of matters and it can be anywhere from the range of 1 to 100 nanometers. Mm -hmm. Here we have a scale of uh, all the different uh, magnitudes of size. So we have all the way from water to hobbits. Okay, for reference, you can see that the human hair is about 75,000 nanometers. So that should tell you about, so, so that should tell you just how small nano is. I think a lot of people will be asking right now, exactly why it's so useful and what's so, different, and what's so different about nano. So when you think about nano, we will, we will think about how it has a much larger surface area to volume ratio. So that's just plain math. When you have a very small object, the surface ratio will be very large as compared to the volume. So when we go down to the nano size, we also can take note that the quantum mechanical effects are non-trivial as compared to objects of uh, larger size. So when we, think of, uh, when, we, when we are talking about quantum mechanical effects, we, can, we are thinking about how they have new physical and chemical properties, and they are not just miniaturized versions of the macro world and the normal classical effects. Finally, here we have a slide of um, two different microscopes. The part of the growing interest towards nano was due to the discovery of more accurate microscopes. Over here we have SEM and the AFM. And this allows for relatively clear images of objects in the nanoscale. And this is in contrast with regular optical microscopes, the one we are familiar with, which are limited by the wavelength of sound or light, which is 10 to the power of negative 7 meters. So moving on, um, I'll be covering some of the chemical synthesis of nanomaterials, which will be, uh, which is the basic principles as well as how to synthesize um, gold nanoparticles and gold nanorods. So firstly, um, before we begin synthesis, we need to understand the idea of colloids because um, essentially most nanoparticle synthesis are based on two like aqueous solutions when you mix them together and you get solid particles out of them. So you need to understand some chemistry of um, how like solids and aqueous can actually exist in the same uh, beaker, for example. So on the right, you can see that the first image is actually a picture of fog, which is um, how gas and water particles are actually together. And the second picture is actually a blood vessel, which you can see red blood cells in the, our blood vessels. So moving on, um, for all precipitation kind of reactions that we actually do, for example, AGCL or those that you do in the lab, right? Actually, most of all of them involves surfacing uh, nucleation. And the idea of nucleation is that um, when your first aqueous particle changes to a solid form, right? There's actually this thing called a nucleation site. And what happens during a precipitation reaction is that you can actually have homogeneous or heterogeneous nucleation, where homogeneous nucleation means that all the aqueous uh, particles are converted to solid at the same time, whereas heterogeneous means that they are converted at different times. So this actually results in different shapes of the nanoparticles being formed. And after a uh, nucleation, growth will happen, which means that um, the different aqueous particles, they actually act on the original nucleation site, and then you'll grow, as you can see from the diagram. So the idea of nanoparticles, right, we know that it has to be very small for it to achieve its desired properties. Hence, they actually require strong nucleation, which means that there must be multiple nucleation sites, and then it must also have slow growth to ensure that it doesn't actually um, grow to be too big, because we want the nanoparticles to be controlled at a small size. So, um, yeah, as mentioned, so you want, for example, if you have like a fixed amount, number of moles of certain of a chemical, you want it to have many small molecules rather than two like very big molecules because uh, you want it to be in a nano scale. 
So uh, moving on, in general, for the chemical synthesis of metallic nanomaterials, which means metals, you actually involve a metal cation, which is M+, uh, followed by a redu using a reducing agent, as well as a capping agent, which helps to stabilize um, the formation of such nanoparticles. So these are just some examples where the metals, I think everyone is quite familiar with that, and then reducing agents can be citrate or alcohols, as they are weak reducing agents, and the capping and stabilizing agents help in the formation of nanoparticles, which I'll be covering next. So for the example of gold nanoparticles, I'll be using an example of gold nanoparticles where a gold 3 plus is used and a reducing and stabilizing agent will be sodium citrate. So uh, we can see that what happens after the first gold nanoparticle is a uh, gold is gold 3 plus is reduced to gold nanoparticle is that the citrate ions, right? Um, they actually form like native bonds around the gold nanoparticle. So this actually you can see that it prevents um attraction between the two nanoparticles that are formed because uh, citrate is negatively charged. So what happens is that when you have many of these gold nanoparticles that are formed with citrate surrounding it, the negative charge around the gold nanoparticle will repel each other, and this prevents it from agglomerating, and you'll produce smaller particles. So an interesting fact is that actually in the nano scale, right, there's actually a lot of different properties. For example, the color of solutions are actually different. So gold and silver nanoparticles actually show distinctive colors um, that are not gold, in the nanoscale, and this is actually due to surface plasmon resonance, which I will not be covering today. So moving on, there's also the uh, in increasing use of nano rods, which are essentially um, like rods in the nanoscale. And how this actually can be synthesized is through using nanoparticles, and then you'll add this thing called CTAB, which is actually a rod-like template, and you'll get gold nano rods. So this is the structure of CTAB, and you can see that it has a quaternary uh, ammonium ion which will be used later. So, <laughs> yeah, so in general, you'll see that the, goals, the, the synthesis of gold nanorods actually involves a seed, which is actually a gold nanoparticle, and then the CTAB, which is actually the uh, rod-like template, actually surround the uh, gold nano seed, so it will uh, force the nano seed to actually grow in one direction, and this is due to the preferential absorption of the uh, ammonium head to the crystal surfaces of the nanoparticle, and then subsequent growth will lead to um, the growth of the nano rod due to preferential dispersion forces and interactions with the ions. <laughs> so moving on, um, just now James actually briefly covered on some of the microscopy techniques that can be used to observe nanoparticles, and this is how, an example of how nano rods can actually be observed. As you can see that um, the nano rods are actually just growing in size, and this is actually observed using a transmission electron microscope. And then another thing that's interesting is that, let's say when you want to synthesize, you don't really know what is the kind of nanoparticle that you're getting. So what you actually can do is that you can um, use UBIVIS, which is a spectroscopy technique that we have learned, to actually compare between the, um, the spectrum of the different nanoparticles. So if you focus on A and B, you can see that A is actually a spherical, spherical shape nanoparticle, whereas B is actually a rod-like shape nanoparticle. And you can actually see that the differences is mainly that A has one peak, and whereas B has two distinct peaks. So the reason for this, right, is because A is a spherical shape, and uh, so it, like wherever light is uh, absorbed, there will only be like one peak that's observed. Whereas for a nano rod, right, there's actually like two planes. You can imagine there's a transverse plane as well as a longitudinal plane. So these two planes will actually result in different different absorption, and this will actually lead to the different peaks that's shown on the spectrum. And then for C, it's actually a star shape nanoparticle, and D is actually a cage-shaped nanoparticle. So this will help scientists to actually um, <laughs> confirm what is the nanoparticle that they have synthesized and whether how successful is the synthesis process. Okay, now we'll be moving on to some applications of nanomaterials. So some of the common applications of nanomaterials will be in your catalytic converters, where you have your platinum or your ro rhodium uh, nanomaterial, nanomaterials, which explodes the high surface area to volume ratio. You also see nanomaterials like zinc oxide in your sunscreen. So now we're moving on to uh, dry sensitized solar cells, which are also called the Grezzo cell. Yeah, and the three important things to take, which I'll be discussing here, will be the electrolyte, the dye, and the titanium dioxide nanoparticles. And this Grezzo cell was obviously discovered by someone called Michael Grezzo. So in the dye sensitized solar cell, there are mainly four steps, which are photo excitation, injection, regeneration and recombination. So firstly, um, your titanium dioxide is bonded to your ruthenium dye, 
and mm. I'll show you the bonding later. But what is important here is that your your pi electrons, conjugated pi system in your um, ruthenium dye, right? The electron in the homo will gain an will gain energy from the photon, and you'll be excited to the lumo. Yeah. So this is how your um this is how a different uh like the different ways that your titanium dioxide can be bonded to your ruthenium dye. And your electron, which has been excited, will move along these bonds and you move to the titanium, the conduction band in your titanium dioxide. Because it's like uh, of a low energy level, and an excited electron wants to go to a low energy level. So after it reaches the titanium dioxide, it will go to the anode and it will pass through the external circuit and reach the cathode. So what links the cathode to the anode is an electrolyte solution, which in the case of disensitized solar cells, is I minus and I3 minus. So you have a redox reaction which happens. And first, so for the uh, movement of electrons from the cathode back to the dye, first it combines with your I3 minus and it's reduced to I minus. And then um, your ions move to the dye and it is oxidized and you get back your electrons. So like in summary, right, the electrons in your homo will gain energy from a photon they rise to the lumo, and then they um go they they drop to the lower energy of the conduction band in your titanium dioxide, travel through the external circuit, and get back to the electrolyte, and they go back to the homo of the dye. And the difference between the energy levels is the voltage that you will get. Okay, hi. So next, I'll be going through another application of nanomaterials that I trust many of you have heard of, which is carbon nanotubes. And actually, when it comes to carbon nanotubes, right, you'll be surprised at, at how many types of carbon nanotubes there are. So if you look at the far left, right, there's actually the, the zigzag configuration. So you can see the, the red lines that are highlighted in the pictures represent the shape. So in the middle, you have the armchair, and to the right, you can actually have something called a chiral nanotube. And all three types of nanotubes, right? Turns out they have quite different properties. And how we can understand how we get these three different types of nanotubes is basically by taking a flat sheet of graphene, which is uh, sp2 carbon-carbon bonds. And basically, the numbers that you see uh, in the coordinates, right, is actually vectors that represent the axis that you rotate, that, that you twist, the, that you roll up the nanotube. The, the, the graphene sheet in order to get the nanotube. Uh, that being said, there are still some general properties behind the nanotubes in that they have high electrical conductivity, quite exceptional tensile strength as well as thermal conductivity. So for electrical conductivity, it's actually more complicated than just having delocalized uh, electrons throughout the nanotube and the electrons are free to move. And this is because of the mathematical calculation of the band gap. So it turns out that after mathematical treatment, you can get the armchair, most armchair nanotubes are actually metallic in nature, where the valence band and the conduction band actually overlap. So that means that if we apply a potential difference across the nanotube, the electrons are actually free to move across the length of the nanotube, and it's actually far more effective at conducting electricity than normal metals, such as copper. So the natural question would be why? So Actually, it turns out that in order for electrons uh, to move through the metal, right, it has to collide into, it has to wiggle past uh, many bulking metal atoms, and that turns out to contribute to some of the resistance that we see in metal. Whereas it turns out that in the armchair nanotubes, uh, you can actually have the electron freely moving across the length of the nanotube with little resistance. Whereas uh, if you compare to most zigzag or chiral nanotubes, they actually turn out to be semiconductors where there is a band gap, but the band gap is small. So what you can do is you can apply a little bit of energy by maybe shining a bit of light. And thus, uh, this allows for the use of this zigzag and chiral nanotubes as semiconductors. So for carbon nanotubes tensile strength, you can see that the tensile strength of carbon nanotubes is actually up to 400 times that of steel. And we can understand this as part, uh, uh, based on structure and bonding. So uh, in carbon nanotubes, there's actually giant covalent bonding where there's a network of covalent sp2 carbon-carbon bonds. But then uh, why is it that um, 
carbon nanotubes are still not widely applied in our everyday appliances is because of the weak shear interactions between adjacent nanotubes. So you can imagine it as individual nanotubes being very, very strong. But if you have multiple nanotubes in a bulk application, you require many, many nanotubes linked together. And so this weak shear interaction is actually the limiting factor behind the, the strength of the carbon nanotube. However, we can see that this, this nanotubes is actually applied not as a main material, but as the additive to further strengthen everyday, uh, at, like commonly used uh, materials. And we can see this being used in tennis rackets and even bicycle springs. And carbon nanotubes turn out to be very uh, super conductive below 20 kelvins. And uh, one way that carbon nanotubes can transfer for heat is through the vibration of the carbon-carbon covalent bonds. So if you have a nanotube, right, you apply heat on one end, what this causes is the carbon-carbon bonds to, to vibrate. So since the carbon-carbon bond is very stiff, right, the vibration of this atom greatly affects the next atom's vibration. And so you can see that the, the heat actually uh, propagates very effectively throughout the nanotube. Uh, and I trust that many of you all have heard of this term called Venta Black, and it's actually responsible for this famous optical illusion that you see on the left. So what you see is nothing, right? It's because uh, of the material which allows for the absorption of over 99.9% of light. And actually, Venta stands for vertically aligned nanotube arrays, which means the nanotubes are at large. Uh, there are some defects here and there, but they are at large aligned vertically so that if light enters at an angle, what happens is all, most of the photons bounce uh, back and forth between the nanotubes until they are even, eventually absorbed. And so while this is very good application as artwork, uh, there's also some practical applications such as in the use in space telescopes. So very interestingly, uh, space turns out to be brighter than we think because in Earth, right, we have the Earth's atmosphere to help absorb some of the sun rays, but in, in space it's mainly vacuum. So there's no such atmosphere to help us absorb sunlight. And so if you want to observe far away objects like far away stars or far away planets, we have to be able to block out some of the sunlight that is distracting our, that is lowering the, the resolution of our images that's obtained. And so NASA actually uses Venta Black in their telescopes. Okay, so moving on from what Alan said, now we'll just be talking about some um, interesting developments in the future of nanomaterials. So, uh, so we are still on the topic of carbon nanotubes. So here we have uh, solar panels. Oh, we have solar panels. So uh, as you can see, pyro, polypyro uh, SWCNTs, where CNT stands for carbon nanotubes, and fuller rings that maximizes the amount of photocurrent produced by absorbing a broader range of solar spectrum wavelengths. In particular, you can see the cells uh, significantly absorb near the infrared portion, uh, infrared portion of the spectrum a range that is commonly inaccessible to many leading key film photovoltaic uh, technologies. By using these multiple priorities, our CNT solar cells absorb across a wider range of the solar spectrums, and this can lead to higher and this can lead to higher currents and efficiencies. So you see, uh, essentially, what this means is that traditional uh, solar panels they only absorb near the uh, infrared spectrum of the, our light. Well, but whereas when you use uh, polychiral carbon nanotubes to uh, make your solar panels, you can absorb a broader range of the uh, radiation, which means, of course, more efficiency. And next, when we move on to transistors, carbon nanotubes have some interesting developments there too. Because, when we, uh, because uh, over here, when we look at this CNFETs, which are carbon nanotube field effect transistors, around an order of magnitude more energy efficient than silicon-based transistors. Unlike our traditional silicon-based transistors, um, of which they are mainly made, uh, of which they are made at temperatures around 450 to 500 degrees Celsius. This CNFETs, the image over here, uh, also can be manufactured at near room temperature. And this means that you can actually build layers of circuits right on, on top of previously fabricated layers of chips, uh, layers of circuits to create a three-dimensional chip, such as the one here. And when you compare this with traditional silicon-based technology, you can't do this because you will melt all the um, silicon layers underneath. A 3D computer chip can combine logic and memory functions and is projected to beat the performance of a state-of-the-art 2D chip made from our typical silicon by our orders of magnitudes. So um, it gives us something to look forward to. 
Okay, so going back to the big picture of, uh, of nanomaterial, the image on the right, uh, the image on the left, is the father of nanotechnology himself, physicist Richard Feynman. And, uh, Richard Feynman, sorry. And uh, he kind of sparked interest in nanotechnology with his talk. There's plenty of room at the bottom. In his talk, he, meant, he described a process in which scientists would be able to manipulate and control individual atoms and, and uh, molecules. However, current products uh, are mainly used technologies that are about applications and do not involve atomic control of matters. So um, maybe in the future we'll be able to achieve something like this. Here's another uh, interesting development. Uh, in the field of drug, uh, drug delivery, a, re a research paper that we found uh, says that there are only very few nanoparticle-based medicines that are on the market or in late clinical trial. So I think that's, uh, the research paper was published around 2015, so it was uh, around that, those years. And uh, in the research paper, they mentioned that this could be due to two main reasons. One, which is poor drug loading, and the second, which is too rapid release of an encapsulated drug after administration. Over here on the image on the right, we have uh, just a simple example of one of the drug delivery nanoparticles that uh, is actually uh, being manufactured and consumed today. Okay, finally, when we look at the world of uh, computer nanochips, there are also possibilities uh, when we consider nanoparticles. In consumer electronics, uh, we have, okay, consumer, uh, sorry, computer nanochips are no doubt important to our world today because uh, it's in all the applications and all the um, appliances that we use, such as the smartphones. Okay, on the image on the right, we can see that new technologies have been developed with computer nanochips. There will be a novel concept involving sending electrons through narrow air gaps, such as the one over here, where previously we'll be sending electrical currents through silicon. These gaps are only a few tens of nanomaterials, so they are on the nanoscale, but it's enough to fool electrons into thinking that they are traveling through vacuum and recreate our outer space for electrons within this nanoscale egg. So this is one future possibility that will enable our microchips to be a lot more powerful in the future. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hey, uh, <coughs> we will take questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. So how does the citrate ions like bind to the uh, gold nanoparticles? How come if they're like negatively charged, why wouldn't it just like repel away from each other? So so the citrate ions actually act as um reducing agent first thing. So you can imagine that there's like um gold three plus nanoparticles. So what happens is that you actually attract the gold nanoparticles first, and then you undergo reduction. Citrate will be oxidized to uh, carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And then like the gold three plus will be reduced to gold nanoparticles. So afterwards, right, because um, metals and ions are actually, like the lone pair of uh, citrate ions can actually donate electrons and form like bonds. So what happens is that it actually forms like a shell around it. Yeah, I think I can think of it as um, how like different things are being solvated in a solution also. Yeah. But the idea is that um, because uh, it, it can also be because citrate is like sort of larger in size, so like when it attracts, right, and then it will actually repel other others uh, citrate bound gold nanoparticles. Yeah. But uh, actually, 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 I think maybe uh, like adsorption onto the gold nanoparticle also. I think. But I'm not sure. I was just thinking whether that is like possible. Yeah, but because, because it's a metal, it's like a metal, uh, it's like pure metal, so it's like very weird if it donates. Because it's not, not like ions that like, can donate on gas on the board. So I think maybe it's like, phys like some physical adsorption. And by the way, my second question is, um, like regarding like, uh, like, you know the electrical conductivity of uh, carbon nanotubes, right? Like, is there any difference with like, let's say a normal graphene sheet? And if there's any difference, like why is there any difference? A bit out of my capability at the moment, uh, but, but I think I think uh, all I can say is that I, I read some research papers. Right, they they, they I, I searched for okay why is uh, why are some uh, carbon nanotubes semiconductors while others are metals, and then the results came uh, the electrical conductivity of carbon nanotubes are complex, <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I I I'm guessing that it's mainly due to the calculation of the the band gap uh, between the valence band and the conduction band. And I think for graphene, 
graphene is known to be electrically conductive. Okay, yeah, I'm not too sure too. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, just due to time, I'll stop here. Good two question. Thank you for this group. Okay, uh, I'll just quickly address the question now. Uh, um, the goal and the secret is like just like absorption, not correct. It's like uh, your your goal is having empty. You have empty orbitals, then you can actually take or accept low pair electrons. Now. Simply say it's just like uh, your catalytic properties of your uh, so the those metals, the heterogeneous catalysis. Yeah, it's probably the same concept. Um, graphene and carbon tubes. Uh, depending on types of carbon tubes, you can have different conductivity. Graphene is if it's a pure graphene, it's a perfect lattice. If it's a perfect lattice. The electrons move through graphene like as if it's a wave. Okay, so it has zero resistance. Yeah, the same goes for CNT. If it's a perfect CNT, um, that is of the correct kind. Right. Otherwise, uh, your your conductivity will not be that good if there's any imperfection. Okay. Um. Yeah. Just to share, nano science nano material is my is why I is where I graduated from in uni. Right. And I used to teach. A similar module in uh, NUS last time. Okay, we we'll have the next group from Eurofort. Okay, so uh, can that side getting ready? All right, uh, can share the screen once you are ready. Okay, uh, for the next presentation. Okay, so we have a group from Eurofort to present with us regarding nitrogen heterocycles. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um. Yeah. So today, will be pre uh, my presentation will be on nitrogen containing heterocyclic compounds. Right. Okay. It sounds like it's like a mouthful of stuff to say, uh, So I will I try to go a bit slower so that everyone can like for the benefit of those who are not that fast. Uh. Okay, yeah. So um, I want, like I think we are all very familiar with uh this benzene friend of ours right um so today the thing that we're going to be learning about is actually really similar to this structure all right so um it undergone a bit uh, a few changes right and then so yeah so so like it grew uh, a nitrogen like it is the carbon got replaced yeah so this like segues into what we're going to be learning about today yeah so uh, heterocyclic compounds also known as heterocycles right so what exactly is a heterocycle right we can begin by like breaking down the word heterocycle just means like there's a hetero portion and a cycle portion hetero just means like different for example like heterogeneous or homogeneous so hetero means different and cycle just means a, cy a cyclic compound right so a heterocycle is essentially a cyclic compound that contains two or more elements as members of its ring or its rings. Yeah. So an example would be pyro, which uh, the carbon is substituted for an N, uh, for nitrogen. Uh, it can be furan, which is sub substituted for oxygen or yeah, like sulfur. Yep. So um, some more background info. The most recognized way to classify heterocycles right, is actually by the ring size. So as you can see, like there are like many derivatives of um, this one, like class, right? They can go from like a three-member ring all the way to like a ten-member ring, yeah. And so they can, uh, he like heterocycles can also be either saturated or unsaturated, right? So saturated just means that, like the like a carbon has like the maximum number of like hydrogens bonded to it, right? But so we will only be focusing on the unsaturated versions because like the saturated versions just kind of. Like for for example, in for nitrogen, right? It just acts like a secondary amine. Yeah, and if you replace the air with like oxygen, right? It just like kind of acts as an ether. Yeah. So those are can cover under H two, which is like no, we're, we're gonna focus on today. Yeah. So um, under nitrogen containing heterocycles, the most commonly, I mean, the most common compounds that you see will be pyro and pyridine right? and for the purposes of like time you only look at uh pyro today yeah okay so um so 
this was the previous uh, syllabus under farm chem, right? And so there are three like uh, learning objectives or outcomes that you need to know. So basically one, you need to be able to compare the relative aromaticity of the three derivatives. Um, you also need to describe the electrophilic substitution reactions as exemplified by nitration, Friedel Crafts, isolation and alkylation. Yeah. And lastly, you have to explain the, elect the effect of electron withdrawing groups on the reactivity and the position of the substitution. Okay, yeah. So um, now I will just cover the first learning point first, the aromaticity. Yeah. So uh, I understand that like we haven't really covered the concept in H2. So for the benefit of those that like don't really know what it is, right? So aromaticity is basically like a feature of a compound, right? That like it's actually a feature of a unique it refers to the unique stability of a delocalized pi system. So there are like many types of delocalized pi systems, like a conjugated uh diene, for example, right? But so aromaticity will differ, like will be different from um, like your average double bonds uh, being conjugated in that if you are like if you are able to meet a, a specific kind of condition, it will actually give it extra stability, right? So the four conditions for that stability is actually that yeah. So the four rules: one, the compound must be cyclic; it must be planar. Um, yeah, it must have a conjugated system of alternating double and single bonds. And lastly, it must follow Huckel's rule, which is, it means that it must have four N plus two pi electrons within the, the system. Yeah. And uh, some trivia, so the guy who came up with the word, right, it was also the guy that came up with the, the same guy that came up with like the Hoffman elimination product. But yeah. Okay, so now we can go through a bit of examples, right? So we're all very familiar with benzene. Right, so it's cyclic, it's planar, has a conjugated system, and it follows Huckel's rule. Because if you count, it has three double bonds, each of them has two pi electrons, so it adds up to six, right? Therefore, it is a aromatic compound. And same thing for naphthalene, right? It's cyclic, it is planar, has a conjugated system, and it has ten pi electrons because it has five uh, double bonds, right? So this is also an aromatic compound. Right, and for the last example, we have like cyclo-1,4-butadiene, right? And so it's cyclic, it's planar, has a conjugated system, but it doesn't follow Huckel's rule. So this means that, like, because it doesn't follow Huckel's rule, right, it doesn't, like, fulfill the conditions, the, the special conditions, right? So it actually will lack this kind of special stability, right? So it only has four pi electrons, and this is what we call anti-aromatic, right? But um, I won't be going that into that today. So now we can look at whether or not, like, analyze the structure of pyro, right? So the nitrogen and carbon atoms in pyro are sp2 hybridized, right? And they have a trigonal planar geometry, and they are also in a conjugated system, right? So if you look at um, the lone pair of nitrogen, right, you might initially think, like, for me, I, I, I thought that the lone pair was in, like, a sp3 hybridized orbital, because I was like, nitrogen has, like, three bonds. But um, so nitrogen actually preferentially adopts a sp2 hybridization, and the lone pair on the nitrogen will be found in the p orbital, meaning it is actually able to delocalize into the system, right? So if you take a look at this, the resonance structures, you can see how the the lone pair on the nitrogen can actually delocalize. Yeah. So pyro is actually uh, an aromatic compound, and I will be looking more into this. Okay, so I'll be talking about like the relative aromaticity, right? So um, we have to compare the, the three different compounds, like which one is more aromatic than the other, which one is more stable than the other. So um, like one way to do this uh, is by comparing the electronegativity, right? So looking at um, sulfur, nitrogen, and oxygen, right? So the, the, the electronegativity actually increases from sulfur to oxygen, right? So that means that the lone pairs on the heteroatom uh, become increasingly less available 
to be able to like participate in the delocalization. So they are less able to delocalize into the ring because they are held on more tightly by the heteroatom. Right. So in this case, the aromaticity will actually decrease uh sorry increase uh wait wait is it decreasing decreasing yeah so the aromaticity actually decreases by right? reason being so sulfur is the least electronegative is the least tendency to hold on to its lone pairs right and so they are most available for participation right and so thiophene actually experiences the most uh aromaticity yeah okay so now we'll be looking at uh, a few of the reactions so pyro actually uh, behaves a lot like benzene, right? So it has like the double bonds, the two double bonds, but they don't actually act like an alkene double bond. Uh. So uh, pyro will actually like behave a lot like benzene and it will undergo electrophilic substitution. But in the three uh, reactions that we are, I mean, uh, we were required to know under the previous syllabus was nitration, isolation, and alkylation. Okay, so um, before we actually discuss the substitution, right, we need to know like where it's being substituted. So like the, the visual selectivity of the substitution, right? So pyro actually has a preference to substitute at the two position rather than the three position, right? Because so if you look at um, the resonance structures, right? So if the, the electrophile, if it attaches to the, the two position, right? Um, the the carbon cation right can actually delocalize over uh, more resonance structures right as compared to if the electrophile attaches to the the three position right so it actually like favors the substitution at two position yeah and so the first reaction the nitration right so pyro reacts with uh, dilute nitric acid and uh, acetic anhydride to undergo nitration. All right, so um, once again, the formation of 2 nitropyro is actually favored due to the stability of the carbocat ion intermediate. All right, if we take a look, yeah, it's the same thing, the three resonance structures are more stable. And so only marked conditions are required in this, this case. Reason being, uh, so the pyro is actually a lot more reactive than benzene. Right, so uh, this is actually quite interesting because so the the electrons right within the pi system in pyro they are being delocalized over five carbons right whereas in benzene right they'll, they'll be delocalized over like six so this actually means that pyro has a higher electron density right so if it's more electron dense it acts as a stronger nucleophile and so it attracts electrophiles more strongly Right, which is why only mild, mild conditions are required. Yeah, so this is uh, the first reaction. Um, so for Friedel Cross isolation, it, uh, it doesn't require very special conditions. Uh, so it just reacts with AC2O and heating, right? And so you substitute in a two and three positions. Yeah, so this is, I think, the most common way to isolate a pyro. But there's other ways, which I'll go through one of them. Yeah, so there is this one thing called the, the Wills-Mayer reaction or whatever. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, yes, so like, like we can go through this uh, a bit slow, slower. So under, in this reaction, a uh, pyro actually reacts with um, uh, an an dimethyl amide and phosphorus chloride to to form the isolated product. Uh, yeah, but in the first step, the POCl3 reacts with um, the dimethyl amide, right, and they form the imanium cation, right. So, um, I mean, if you want to try to draw it, you can. Uh, so. I think I'll give like 30 seconds if you want to like try for yourself. But I'll just like move on quite fast. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I think I'll just present. Anyways, so the mechanism actually goes something like this. So the uh, nitrogen lone pair like 
pushes and then the oxygen uh, bond like attacks the phosphorus and so the double bond on the oxygen gets pushed in right but because it's the phosphorus is attached to like three cl groups right they are very good leaving groups so the oxygen actually forms back the double bond and pushes out the chlorine right so then the chlorine attacks the the new very electrophilic eh? nucleophilic yeah the very nucleophilic uh cation yeah and then you form this uh, nice product okay so this product actually reacts with pyro to form this uh, fancy intermediate and once again if you want to try to write it out you can but i think i'll just present it yeah so uh the this i my name salt that's a pyro uh i i don't think i will like cover yeah you, i mean you can see it for yourself so it forms the product on the bottom right right and then so the last step is just a hydrolysis step with a base and you'll form this isolated product yeah so for alkylation thankfully you don't have to know anything just that uh pyro doesn't actually undergo alkylation with uh like the conventional fluido crossway mainly because like it's too unselective and there's a high tendency for pyro to polymerize under acidic conditions. Yeah. So the only reactions we need to know are nitration and acylation. Okay. Uh, yeah, lastly, I'll just cover a bit on the reactivity and position of the substitution. All right. So for pyro, if you have like an electron withdrawing group, right? Um, so I think it's good to like maybe draw the structure of the carbocation ion. But if you can imagine, right, if the electrophile, like on the left, uh, if the electrophile attaches to the three position, right, then the the plus charge will be on the second carbon, right? Yeah. So yeah, then the lone pair on the nitrogen will be localized over then the plus charge will be on nitrogen, right? Yeah, then, so the the last carbon-carbon double bond will be localized again, and the plus charge actually ends up where the electron withdrawing group is, so it destabilizes it, right? So that's not favorable. Yeah. So CO2H, like, actually directs to the two position, and in this case, there's actually a agreement between pyro and the electron withdrawing group. Same thing for, I mean, for, for bromine, which is like a auto para director, I think, right? So you can try drawing on the structures, but basically it's like, the, if the plus charge, I mean, if the electrophile attaches to the two position, the plus charge end, like ends up on the third carbon, right? Where the BR is attached. And so you know that halogens have like a lone pair that are available for donation. And so this actually stabilizes the carbocation more, right? And yeah. So and for these both these examples, um, the electron withdrawing property actually deactivates the reaction. So more like vigorous conditions are required. But yeah, that's all. Okay. Uh, there's a fine exercise you want to draw. I mean, like you want to try out, right? So. This is a pyro reacts with this thing called the Ehrlich reagent or something. And so it reacts under acidic conditions to form a colored complex, right? A colored compound, sorry. And yeah, so this is a way for detecting pyros. And uh, yeah. So I can spend a bit more time, but I think. Uh, just present the answers, All right? So this is a proposed mechanism by uh, my friend. Yes. So um, you can look through it and see how it roughly occurs, I guess. But yes. So when I mean, that's that kind of like concludes the presentation. Um, 
it's a very, I guess, a fundamental understanding of how heterocycles work. Uh. Hopefully, you could learn something from this. And that's all I have. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think I saw that um, in the uh, acylation and the nitration of the pyrrol, right? I think uh, the, the common reagent used was AC2O. And so I was wondering, why is it that if you add a dilute nitric acid, it will favor nitration over the acylation? Um, I think without this, is it showing? Yes, oh my god. Uh, uh, um, I think the. Wait, where is it? No. So I think just in general, the nitro, the nitro electrophile, right, which is NO2, so it's like N with two, like O double bonded to it, right? So the N has a plus charge is actually a stronger electrophile, I think, as compared to like um, the AC, like the AC electrophile. I, I think that's my understanding of it. Yeah, so it actually attacks the... Okay, uh, we have a comment here. Well, I think another like explanation I have is well, because in acid, you have acid, you hydrolyze uh, like acid and hydride, which is your AC2. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, okay. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So, if you have any question, you can go and find the speaker, okay, and then ask. All right. Uh, we'll take a uh, Five minutes break before the next group from uh Danny Flo will present. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Um okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay, uh okay, never mind. Should be able to a bit louder. Okay. Um so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Lorin and uh together with Larissa, Darren and Jung Jun will be explain will be like teaching us a bit about fluid catalysis that ran up. Uh. Um okay, so let me introduce uh you guys a bit to uh, photocatalysis first. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, what so what is photocatalysis la? So the the word photocatalysis makes I mean has photo and catalysis. So like um, I don't know I don't know about about you guys la, but like what do people normally think of when they see the word photocatalysis? And I mean for me la, right because I'm a bio student like so the thing that I think of would be like photosynthesis. And um, I guess like it, I mean, it, it makes sense, la, um, but like photosynthesis is like only uh, like one specific uh, photocatalytic reaction. La. And um, actually a lot of like chemists, right, and scientists, they, um, they take their inspiration uh, of like photocatalysis uh, from like the natural system uh, in plants uh, that actually uh, help to undergo the natural process of photosynthesis because it is very effective. Uh, uh, yeah, so let me move on. So um, the general definition of photocatalysis is that photocatalysis is the acceleration of a chemical reaction with light. So the, the main focus of this definition is with light because um, light, and, and that uh, will have implications further on because um, like it is the catalysis, right? Um, which requires like energy input from light. So, um, so like why light is because like uh, of the energy that uh, requires uh, for an electron to jump the band gap, and that would have and and uh, without light, right? Um, the catalysis will not take place, and it is not also because light like actually causes like some sort of decomposition la. It is not because of that sort of like energy input, and it is specifically because of um, the electron jumping the band gap. Yeah, so um, let me give you guys a quick history on photocatalysis. So um, actually, the the field of like photo, photo uh, like chemistry has already like um, 
has already been studied for a long time before this, but like photocatalysis is like a branch of like um chemistry with light. Uh. So um in 1901, this uh Giacomo Chemistian guy, um he he tried to study if like light and light alone can uh, enable a chemical reaction and he carried out light he carried out experiments in red and blue light and found that um like the effect that he wanted to look out for like the reaction only took part in blue light and took place in blue, blue light and like you guys can also think of why is it blue light la? like you can link to like uv and like bang gap um and in like 1924 like they found that Prussian blue was bleached by like uh, zinc oxide under illumination and that is also like quite a big discovery because like Prussian blue is like a uh, pigment that is uh, used like in painting and um, yeah and it, and it has quite a lot of widespread users la. and um, that and, and because of uh, these experiments right um, these like zinc oxide titanium uh, dioxide they were actually um, they were actually then found because of like these experiments they were like they then got more research attention and um more more research attention uh and like more scientists afterwards tried uh tried to like um investigate more of their photocatalytic properties um however right the mainstream applications were like absent until 1970s and um it was and it was at the at that decade where it actually got more uh, research interest because of how um more, more research interest because that was when um, people wanted to find, wanted to reduce our uh, reliance to uh, fossil fuels and wanted to um, find like sustainable and renewable energy sources. La, and light was what people turned to. And actually I find, I find that idea quite fascinating because, um, because the thing is that like photosynthesis, like fossil fuel itself is being produced by, it's actually produced from a foot, a uh, photocatalytic process of photosynthesis and actually like like fossil fuel itself is like even though it's seen to be bad but technically photosynthesis is a kind of photocatalysis and i mean that like also explains why people want to um investigate photocatalysis because um photocatalysis is like because the natural form of photocatalysis which is photosynthesis is shown to be so effective Okay, so um, I think this is when like the breakthrough happened. So like these two Japanese scientists, Akira Kurishima and Kenichi Honda, discovered the electrochemical photosynthesis of water when they sh um, shone uh, UV light on titanium uh, dioxide. And like the interesting thing that they found out was, I mean, that the like electro like the electrolysis did not take place um, in un like without light, but it only took place with light. And what's interesting is that it produces um, both hydrogen, like it splits water into both hydrogen and uh, oxygen gas, and that will have implications uh, further on. And after, like ever since this, right, um, scientists just tried to um, investigate and tried to perfect and find like a more effective uh, photocatalysis, photocatalyst, okay. Okay, so uh, the next part of this presentation will be on the different types of photocatalysis. So for today, we're going to talk about heterogeneous and homogeneous, and I'll focus on heterogeneous for now. So uh, heterogeneous catalysis has, is basically like a H2 stuff. So your catalyst is in a different phase from the reactants. And then um, common, common photocatalysts will include transition metal oxide and semiconductors. These catalysts facilitate the reactions between the excited electrons with oxidants to produce reduced products and or reactions between the generator holes with reductants to produce oxidized products. This form of photocatalysis has its own benefits and limitations and which include like benefits like the fact that the product and the catalyst can be easily separated after the reaction which helps to lower costs, but they also run the risk of recombination, which I'll be explaining later, which will reduce the efficiency of the reaction. So how this works, well, this, this heterogeneous photocatalysis happens in four basic steps. So the first one will be the light absorption to generate electron hole pairs. So uh, this process is also known as photo excitation. And uh, looking at the diagram, you can see that there's the valence band, 
which is also known as like the HOMO, yeah, based on my H3 stuff, and the conduction band, which is like the LUMO. And what happens is that an electron from the valence band, an electron from the valence band will absorb a, a photon, which has an energy that is greater than the band gap here. And it will get excited to the conduction band, uh, leaving behind an electron hole, which is small H plus, not to be confused with like your hydrogen ion, but like the main thing that you should focus on for here is that it's an electron deficient hole. Yeah, so this electron hole pair is called an exciton. And for the exciton to remain separated after photo excitation, it has to overcome this uh, exciton binding energy, which is the energy required to ionize an exciton from its lowest energy states. I think an easier way to understand this would be to think of it as like the binding energy between the between an electron and like a proton in hydrogen. So after this, what happens is that after the after photo excitation, the electrons and the electron hole can travel to the surface of the photocatalyst where it's used for reduction. Uh, and oxidation respectively. So for the electron, it can reduce like H plus to H2, and um, the electron hole, which is electron deficient, can be used to oxidize like water to oxygen. And there's also a third pathway for it, which is the recombination of the electron and the electron hole. So uh, this can, this is basically the electron electron merging with the hole, and then uh, in uh, uh, something called either radiative or non-radiative recombination, which will be explained later. And it leads to photocorrosion, which is where both the charges will lose their redox ability by generating either thermal energy or a photon. So uh, I know you guys probably won't be able to answer this yet, but uh, what makes semiconductors good photocatalysts? Okay, so yes, I'll just give you the answer. So they firstly have large band gaps. So like, um, I mean, like if you remember like the very first presentation, they were talking about like the gap between the CV, the conduction band event, and the valence band, right? This band gap is required uh, for the for 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 it to be able to catalyze certain processes well. And this, this concept will be applied later. Like one of them will be explaining later. And so as I was talking about earlier about radiative and non-radiative combination, radiative recombination involves the excited electron that was previously that was previously um yeah, excited from the from the same electron hole that it came from. That they recombine the same electron hole, and and it, this releases energy in the form of a photon. But for non-radiative non -radiative recombination, the hole, the electron actually is excited from the hole, and it moves away before like another electron from another electron hole comes and recombines with it, releasing heat instead. So because um. Because of this photocorrosion, it's important for um, for current photocatalysts to uh, have a have a long exciton life. Uh, it's important for current photocatalysts to um, ensure that excitons can remain separated for as long as possible, so as to ensure that the redox reactions which is here will be able to occur. Yeah. So for the last step of photo uh, of heterogeneous photocat uh, photocatalysis, uh, basically at the surface of your photocatalyst, a redox reaction can occur. So for instance, uh, your electrons can be used to reduce your oxygen into hydroxyl radicals, and uh, the electron hole, which is electron deficient, will be able to oxidize water to produce your hydroxyl radicals. So one of the most uh, common photocatalysts is PiO2 or titanium dioxide, 
And a, pro a proposed mechanism for water oxidation is as follows. So firstly, just to clarify, uh, this first arrow here doesn't re represent a transfer of electrons, but rather it, it just indicates the movement of the hole uh, to the surface of this uh, photocatalyst. So this would produce a electron deficient uh, oxygen, uh, which will then, which, uh, so this uh, electro de electron deficient oxygen is now susceptible to nucleophilic attack by water to form the radical. So the so this uh, unstable radical will then continue in the same reaction and eventually it will produce oxygen. So the second form of photocatalysis is homogeneous cata photocatalysis in which both the re uh, reactants and the photocatalyst will exist in the same phase. So uh, I will not go into too much detail for this one, but basically similarly under light irradiation, uh, ir yeah, a molecular photocatalyst or PCAT for short, can be promoted to the excited state as electrons from the HOMO is excited to the LUMO. So the resulting PCAT star is both a strong oxidant and reductant, and hence it can ideally drive full redox reactions. So one example is uh, ozone photocatalysis, where ozone molecules are first cleaved by photons to generate an oxygen molecule and an oxygen atom, and then it then combines with a water molecule and either splits up into two hydroxyl radicals or form, hyd uh, form hydrogen peroxide molecule, which will then be cleaved by photons into two hydroxyl radicals. However, one limitation of your photo homogeneous photocatalysis is that since both the reactants and photocatalysts are in the same phase, once the reaction is complete, uh, it's, it's more difficult to separate uh, the two. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, so after all of those, right, um, what are the applications of such a process? Eh? Well, uh, there are a few ways, lah, but for this one, I'll segue to a process which most biology students will probably know, lah, photosynthesis. So um, photosynthesis actually has two processes. Uh, for those who don't take biology, it's called a light-dependent stage and light-independent stage. Especially during the light-dependent stage, uh, you have a process called photolysis, where um, light is used to split a water molecule into hydrogen ions and oxygen atoms. But the thing is, the entire the thing is um, the entire uh, photosynthesis process right requires many um, intricate biological systems such as photosystems that cannot be replicated by today's technology. So in this case, right, photocatalysis is recognized as a potential use in artificial photosynthesis. And I'll focus on this part called photocatalytic water splitting, which is um, similar to the process of photolysis of water, um, which is found in photosynthesis just now, and it's a potential technology for fuel production. Okay, so this diagram over here, okay, um, I'll, I'll be a bit slow over here. Okay. Over here, you have your photocatalyst, which is a uh, TiO2. The reason why we want to have TiO2 is because we want that then gap that is larger than the difference between the reduction and uh, reduction potential of the E naught of H plus H2 and uh, E H2O and O2. So with this diagram over here, right, the current equation is this, where you have um, your water oxidation and your water reduction over here. So the overall reaction is the splitting of water into 2H2 and O2. Okay. Um, I didn't, uh, we've forgotten to include the values over here, but in any case, um, it actually, the E0 values uh, actually goes from um, negative to positive from top to bottom in this case. So um, basically, uh, basically when you, when you shine a light, it excites the electron in the BB to the CB. So when you have the electron up here, right, then it's more likely, because it has a very negative uh, E0 value, uh, in this case, it's actually negative 0 0.50, la, which is higher than the 0, 0.00 over here. So it's more likely to become oxidized and give out the electron away. So the electron actually travels away, blah, blah, blah. And the other comes here and um, you, and then this is where the react, then it reacts over here. La. Then, um, you know, the removal of the electron generates a, a hole in this case over here, and it's used for the oxidation. The oxidation uh, of the the uh, to form to form um, sorry oxidation of H two to form the O two over here. 
Okay. Um, another. Okay. Another one, right? Okay. Another um way of another use for photocatalysis is basically the removal of organic pollutant from water. So. Um, in a sense, right, it helps to control, helps in controlling and uh, eliminating hazardous waste lah, through this process called advanced oxidation processes. And um, uh, in this pro in this sort of process, right, you have you mineralize organic compounds, water pathogens, and disinfection byproducts through the generation of highly reactive transitory species such as uh, H two O two, O H minus, and so on. Um, in this case, right, OH radicals are particularly useful because of high oxidative potential. And okay, this diagram over here, I will have to uh, put a disclaimer. Um, the last step from this step over, right, is actually um not correct because the the, the research paper where we get where we got the diagram from right, is actually uh, there's actually a typo over here. They missed out carbon over here. But I will try to explain the, the first three parts over here. So you have your flock four chlorophenol, which is uh, an organic compound. And what happens is the photo, so photocatalysis, photo right, causes the generation of a uh, electron hole through the excitation of electron from DB to CBR. Then um, over here is not shown, but there's actually water and oxygen present over there in TiO2 as well. Then it will undergo uh, the reaction to form an OH radical. Which so you have the OH radical which will which will then uh, react with uh four chlorophenol, then you you uh generate this. It's called four C D. Then uh from then from this part over here to here is actually a recombination uh reaction where um uh the electron hole recombines with the uh electron to form a hydro uh, But that's not what we want lah. Um in the second step, right over here, right, it's actually it actually involves a uh, holotic cleavage. Uh, so the one electron from this OH actually joins up with the the uh, uh, lone electron over here to form a bond uh, to form your the profile over here, and then the H atom is just lost. Then um yeah, from this point onwards, it is wrong already. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. But eventually, right? Um, if the diagram is drawn correctly, right? After a, a, a range of uh reactions, right? You eventually form CO two, which is uh not organic anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Let's come to the end. Thank you. Very good control timing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, thank you very much for your presentation. We will get the uh, next group to be ready. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jing Kang, and it's Brian. And today we're presenting in like doping in sports. So, uh, <laughs> so that like our team of content, right? So we are going to bring you through a, like a small journey from like introducing you to how the doping products are synthesized, to how it works on the body, to how it's detected in the end. Now, uh, something that's not very related is. Uh, when we talk about doping, right, the first time we search doping up online, right, they give us semiconductors, so we will cover it in one slide. And that's the addition of small quantities of an element, right, that's like, they usually use boron and phosphorus because of um, it having three valence uh, electron and five valence electron, respectively, to like a pure semiconductor. And uh, actually, if you have more time, we'll talk about it, but there's an electron hole, if you notice, for the boron, because it has only got three electrons, it will be missing one electron, and that is what results in the semiconductivity, which is like talked about by the previous groups as well. Okay, but like this is from the topic I'm talking about today. The topic I'm talking about today is actually the doping for sports. So what's the meaning? They're using a substance to easily improve like athletic performance. So it's a guy here, you inject him something, yeah, and it becomes stronger. Cool. Now we'll be talking about the anabolic androgenic steroids. Now what I what is the anabolic androgenic steroid? It sounds very complex, but it's actually quite simple. Now to talk about it, anabolic stands for the building of muscles, or androgenic stands for anything that's related to the development of male hormones. So basically, these steroids can help you build muscle and promote like some of the development of male hormones. And uh, some of some of the background info, as mentioned, uh, there's the anabolic processes and the androgenic processes. And sometimes when um, um, 
people use drugs, they usually don't use it alone. They use more than one drug at the same time. And just to name two banned drugs, is amphetamine and androstenedione, which we will be mentioning some, what, uh, somewhat in the later slides. Now, to talk about one of the specific drugs, it will be amphetamine. Now, amphetamine looks so harmless, right? But you will find out later that it's actually quite a cool drug. I mean, don't do drugs, but it's quite interesting. And there's two ways where you can synthesize uh, amphetamine in uh, two reactions. And one of the reactions is called the Leukert reaction by this guy here called Lob um, Robert Leukert. His uh, zodiac sign is cancer, so just so you all know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, what, what Leukert does is um, his reaction can allow you to change your ketone to an imine addition. And it's quite important in this addition. But if you can see, it's actually not as complex because this is clearly a nucleophilic um, addition reaction. And the foam, uh, foam amide itself can break down into the ammonium ion and the uh, O minus that you can see there, which will later react again with our product, which is like this product over here. And after that, you will go through um, internally, you will break down some bonds and form some bonds to give us the product at the bottom right, which is amphetamine for amide, which is very close to our final product. But with the help of H plus ions, it can form amphetamine. Now, the next reaction is something that you'll be even more surprised because it's even closer to our heart. It is Fredercraft alkylation. So it's an electrophilic substitution reaction that will result in a product that's very close to our final product. And with the help of the ammonium ion, we can obtain amphetamine. Yeah, so now we'll be talking about some of the cell reactions. So before we cover steroid actions, right, we need to know like how we derive all these kinds of steroids, these are uh, anabolic androgenic steroids. So the first thing you must know, right, is the gonine thing out. Because this gonine, right, is actually like the core in which all the other steroids are built upon. So as you can see this gonine actually is a tetracyclic hydrocarbon rings consisting of 17 carbons. So for like other steroids like, like testosterone or other hormones like progesterone, they just build on top of this gonine ring. Okay, so for another steroid, it's actually called phytosterol. phytosterol. So why am I talking about this? It's actually called the plant-derived compound. So in this case, a lot of our scientists, right, we use this phytosterol to actually convert into other kind of testosterone or like other hormones or other kind of LED drugs. So like some common sources for these phytosterols like from soy or like yam derivatives, I believe. Yeah, and that's just testosterone, like one of the male hormones. Okay, so one of the um, hormones that we talk about is endosindione. So some athletes actually take this to like become stronger and like get better at the sports, but obviously it's banned because they detected like some guy in baseball who used this, yeah. And it got banned in like 1970, like some year, some Olympics. So actually a common precursor for the um, hormones testosterone and estrone. So if you eat too much of this endoskin diode, right, you cause like a woman to become like more like a man. So like the person has like deeper voice and like and like shrunken um yeah, shrunken stuff. <laughs> and for <laughs> okay, and for men, right, interestingly, it's not more like a woman. So actually you suppress like stone production and also cause like some suppression of men characteristics out. So interestingly, this thing actually makes a woman more like a man and a man more like a woman for some reason. That's actually quite an interesting drug, but yeah, don't take it obviously. So this endosine diode, right, what you do, like, after you take it, it first be converted to testosterone by um enzyme called 17 beta hydrosteroid. But after this, right, subsequently it be converted even more by 5 alpha reductase to, an, to another compound called dihydroxyl testosterone. But why do you want to do this? Why do you want to convert testosterone to something else? I think we took something called the anabolic androgenic ratio, which is something quite important when we consider like drugs that you want to take. So the anabolic androgenic ratio, right, is actually um ratio that tells you like how good a drug is compared to its negative side effects. So in this case, like anabolic effects include like muscle synthesis and like bone remodeling out. In short, it's like all the good points of like these kind of drugs. But the androgenic effects are like stuff that messes up with like your endocrine system and your hormonal system. So in this case, some side effects are like it stimulates pubertal growth. And of course, so cause like suppression of like sex hormones. Out. So the ideal scenario, right, would be like if you separate the anabolic and androgenic part of the drug. But unfortunately, this is not possible because to get the anabolic effects, right, you need to go through like the androgenic pathway. So yeah, unfortunately, if you want to gain muscle, you won't have like a bit of like difference with your hormonal system also. So um, some interesting facts, right, like how they derive this anabolic androgenic ratio. So they don't actually use humans to derive this kind of ratio because they need to measure your muscle mass as well as like the mass of like your reproductive organs out. So what they do is actually they take a rat, then they castrate it, they cut off their balls in order to like see. 
Oh uh, yeah, they cut off the reproductive organs anyway to like, prevent any testosterone from going to the rat. And subsequently, they inject the drug to it. I'm glad they kill the rat after some time. Then they measure the rat's muscle mass as well as his femoral vesicles mass to see like how much effect it does have on the rat now. And this ratio, right, actually, the baseline of this ratio is actually testosterone. So like testosterone taken as a base, then any kind of drugs, like the potency is compared to testosterone as a baseline. Okay, so now we're talking about some of the steroid and peptide actions. So this should be more familiar to our bio students. In the case of steroid actions, right, like um, the first few homers we're talking about all steroids. So the kind of steroid actions actually is a more potent because steroids actually directly enter into the cell and it bind with like some hormonal receptor which causes like different formation of new proteins of course it interacts with DNA inside the cell. So in this case for steroid hormones, the action will be a little bit slower because it diffuse in the cell and go through like many barriers. But the effects also be more potent because it actually interacts with the DNA of a cell. In the case of peptide action, right, the, these peptides are consisting of amino acids, which I believe we learned in chemistry also. So these um, peptides, they actually like bind to cell surface receptors. Then like it causes a signal transduction cascade out. Most people that do not know what signal transduction cascade is, it's particularly like a uh, male being passed by several male men. So like it like passed down like a whole chain until it's just the nucleus. In this case, like the signal will be transferred a bit faster, but the effects are not as pronounced. Okay, so now I will go back to how amphetamine works, and this will reinforce the idea of how these drugs work in our body. So how does it make you like so strong? You ask yourself. <laughs> now, but first, before we move on to um, its uh, ultimate uses in doping, you must know that amphetamine has a use in uh, medicine. It's used in Adderall, and uh, Adderall is used to treat ADHD. So in those no stage, you can tell that amphetamine is actually useful for our body. But then, before we introduce amphetamine in how it reacts with our body, we must first introduce this guy called dopamine. And dopamine is naturally produced in our body. Now, doesn't amphetamine look like dopamine? Okay. Does not amphetamine look like dopamine? Yeah, it does. Okay, thank you for your answers. <laughs> so now, how, uh, why will you ask? Will you ask why their structural similarity will result in their action in the body? Now, amphetamine is a full-on agonist for some of the uh, receptors for dopamine. So what does that mean? It means that it can act as dopamine and trigger some of the receptors, even without dopamine binding to the receptors. So it just pretends to be dopamine and it binds the receptor, and the receptor believes that the dopamine has bound to it, so it will trigger a reaction. So, but what does dopamine do? Now we can use dopamine and amphetamine kind of interchangeably both because they kind of act the same way in our body. It is involved in our motor coordination. So you look at this um, picture right here. Do you understand what's going on? Neither do I. No. So, now moving on. <laughs> so let's make, make it a bit simple. The idea is that uh, dopamine basically has, in our body, there's two pathways. There's a pathway that inhibits your motion and there's a pathway that promotes your motion. And both of them work at the same time. So imagine your body as a bicycle. The pathway that allows your motion, uh, that promotes motion, are like the gears in your bicycle. When you oil the gear, you can move faster. And the pathway that inhibits your uh, movement is like the brakes. When you hold on to the brakes, you can't really move, right? So what dopamine does is that it promotes your, uh, it oils up your gears and it inhibits the inhibitor of your movement. So what it does is it releases your brakes, and of course, you can move faster. And this is why dopamine helps in improving athletic performance. Now, something else that dopamine slash amphetamine does is it promotes motivational salience. So what does that mean? In short, it just means that it gives you a reward system. It, it's like, this is why uh, methamphetamine, which is like a more potent version of amphetamine, is a, a very common drug. It's known as meth. And it's very easy to get hooked on this drug because it promotes ecstasy in you when you take it. And actually, motivational silence is actually what gets you up in the morning that motivates you to do things. So when you lie at home and you don't feel like doing anything, you don't have enough dopamine. But when dopamine is too low, it can lead to certain diseases such like ADHD and Parkinson's. And Parkinson's disease should be easier to understand because a lack of dopamine results in your motor coordination being quite flawed, which is like mentioned like the bicycle. So if you don't have enough dopamine, you can't really move as you want to. And some other facts that you need to know is that Dopamine receptors can be found, uh, some of the dopamine receptors, known as D1 receptors, can be found on the walls of arter uh, the arteries. So if it binds to it, it can act as a vasodilator. What that means is that it increases the size of your uh, blood vessels and allows your blood flow to that part of the body. So therefore, if you have more blood and more oxygen, with more respiration, the, part, uh, the, skeletal con uh, the, mus the muscle contraction can be more vigorous and you can act, think, and um, perform better. Now, how does it actually work? 
Now, for the bio students, you might find this kind of familiar because it's a GPLR, as mentioned um, by Brian somewhere in front as well. So both of them can bind to this receptor. And actually, it's kind of easy to understand. Think of the receptor like an uh, enzyme and think of the dopamine like a substrate. It can bind specifically to the substrate and the, the enzyme and substrate can bind together. And this will cause a conformation change in the whole, um, the whole uh, what's that thing, the receptor itself. So when the receptor, the green thing changes, it causes uh, the G protein, which is the red thing that's linked to it, to kind of be activated. And it will just skirt along the cell membrane to the adenylate cyclase, where you will activate it further. So now I will go on to explain about signal transduction in another way, if you ever understand Brian's Millman idea. So think of it like you are telling a gossip to someone. When you are telling a gossip to three people, and the three people tell gossips to another nine people, and the night people tell it to another 16 people, and this is how it goes down and it skews up in terms of the signal transduction. And in the end, your final response in your muscles or in your cell will be quite big. And lastly, dopamine itself is broken down by this thing called monoamine oxidase, known as MAO. So, <laughs> amphetamine can inhibit MAO at high doses, so you can tell that Amphetamine basically makes your body like a dopamine playground. It increases your dopamine and prevents it from being broken down. So with dopamine rampant all over your body, right? Amphetamine can increase your alertness, your muscle strength, your muscle contraction, and how fast you act. Therefore, it's commonly used as a drug, and its derivatives are also used as a drug to promote um, better performance. Okay, so now we're talking about dopamine detection, which is just particularly the fight between uh, the lab and the law. That is a bit cringy, I know. Okay, so now some of the more common detection methods that we have researched, actually, uh, the first one is urine immunoassay, the second one is uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and the last one is hair follicle testing. So um, in this slide, I'll be talking more about the gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. So Mark asked, eh, why I got three money signs here? It's because actually for gas chromatography, right, uh, we need three steps before we can do this gas chromatography um, process. So the first thing you must do is, we need to do sample preparation which is uh, like you need to extract out what you want, like solid state extraction or liquid state extraction. And phase two is using of the gas chromatography. Mass spec. Oh, yeah, okay, well, <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's how you get, um, you know, it costs more and subsequently it also be more accurate because you can like find specific compounds in our gas chromatography and mass spectrometry analysis. Okay, so now we're talking about how this gas chromatography actually works. In this case, right, the goal for gas chromatography is actually for us to separate polar compounds based on mobility. So to understand gas chromatography, the first thing you must look at is our sample graph. So this sample graph is actually an uh, intensity time graph with intensity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So this case is not too different from an NMR graph that you see now. So by separating these volatile compounds based on mobility, right, those compounds that reach the detector first will be more on the left side of the graph. And those that reach the compound last will be on the right side because they take more time to reach the compound. So here's a pictorial representation of our gas chromatography machine. In this case, there's firstly a sample injection system where we mix our samples such as urine or like blood or thing with a volatile compound such as hexane or benzene. Then after that, there's also a carrier gas. We carry the like our sample through the thermostat. In this case, the carrier gas must be a more inert gas like helium or nitrogen, so like you won't explode the whole thermostat obviously. Then uh, you go through this thermostat, which you cause the separation of these volatile compounds based on how fast they travel through this thermostat. Lastly, there is the ionizer which will cause the separation of these compounds into electrons and the cations which reach the detector and cause all the peaks that you see. So now I'll be explaining more about how this thermostat thing works in separating these compounds to cause the sample graph. Okay, so yeah, I drew some lines here using like thick lines. So there's the heart shapes and the um, lightning bolts here as you can see. So these heart shapes and lightning bolts are actually pushed by a carrier gas through the gas chromatography machine. In this case, right, the lightning bolts move faster than this can't say it's move slower, but why? It's because for these lightning bolts, right, they are actually more volatile. So in this case, they interact less with the stationary phase and in fact more with the gaseous phase. So they'll be like more inclined to be carried along this carrier gas and reach the detector first. Another thing that causes this difference in detection time right, is actually the mass of the compound. With a heavier compound, it won't move as fast along the gas chromatography machine. But with a heavier, the lighter compound, it will move faster. So subsequently, these compounds will move through this hydrogen and oxygen burner, which will cause ionization, and cause the electrons to be split from the cat ions, which will be picked up by a detector later on. So now we see a very simple um, graph of a uh, gas chromatography. I couldn't find like a specific molecule graph, so yeah, I just took one of the internet like that. So the first plate is using a solvent plate. We want our solvent to be more reactive because we don't want to mess up the solvent plate. We don't speak from like other compounds. Uh. 
So yeah, having the first peak as a solemn peak actually makes a lot of sense because yeah, it doesn't confuse the other compounds. And of course, the higher the peak, the higher the concentration, similar to NMR, NMR that we learned like in case you can see. And for a peak that's like more to the right, right, either the compound is more is less volatile, so it will move fast, uh, move slower, or the mass is greater, so it will reach the compound. I mean that the detector has slower time. Now we're talking about uh, ESIMS, which is short for Electrospray Ionization Mass Spectrometry, which is actually what we have learned, but I will re-explain it a bit. So uh, you have a compound that either from gas chromatography and it's verified by gas chromatography or just a normal compound, you dissolve it in methanol and you heat it and vaporize it. So after you vaporize it, you beam it with the laser, uh, no, not, you beam it with a high energy ray. Then you can, that, that will result you being able to ionize the, your compound, such that your compound is charged. Which is very important because you are going to fire it through a magnetic field, through a band. So those heavier compounds, right, when they get fired through the magnetic field, right, they are very heavy and slow to move. So they will get like stuck on the wall or something. So they won't hit the detector as much as the lighter compounds. And this will result in our full spectrum of what you see as a mass spec that's going to be tested most probably in our history exam. So this is um, our mass spectrum graph that um, is quite common for ephetamine. As you can see, right, it's not very beautiful because uh, your ephetamine actually breaks down and fragmentizes very easily. And that's why it's kind of hard for us to detect drugs, even with a mass spectrometry, unless we already know of the certain drug. So I think that um, the World Anti-Doping like, Agency, WADA, has like 400 banned drugs, and they have a whole database of the drugs in their uh, MS. So they already know that it's going to look like that. So they, will, they can like compare it and see whether you're using any of the known drugs. But if you use novel drugs, right, it's going to be slightly harder for you to detect. So this is a, a very cool drug name. It's called LGD-2226. It's a new class of drugs that's known as a SARM. I think that means uh, the Selective Androgenic Receptor uh, Modulator. So what it does is it's quite similar to the anabolic androgenic steroids, but with less side effects. So you might think, hey, isn't that better? Like it does the same thing, even more selective sometimes and it has less side effect. So why is it still banned? Well, this is to do with like drugs itself not being very sportsmanship like, and it is something, it doesn't really promote equity, you know? Like this, this is a kind of a serious problem because like you will see all the countries send their athletes, but what if all the athletes level are quite similar, but because one country can sponsor the drug usage for their athletes, therefore being better, that doesn't like, isn't the kind of sportsmanship you want to see. So this is why, um, the WADA is con continuously combating against the uh, new drugs, even though the new drugs might have less side effects. Yeah. So, all right, my kids, don't do drugs. Thank, Thank you. you.